So this is Councillor Bill Psalms, and I'm calling this first Finance Committee meeting of the Ledger Town Council to order at 5 p.m. on Wednesday, January 6th. First meeting of the year, present are uh, Councillor Ingalls, a uh, member of the committee, Councillor McGratton, Mayor Allen, and Roxanne Marr. And with that, are there any citizens' comments? I don't see or hear any. So I'll wait a second. Um, I don't believe I have any informational items other than what I just shared about Tom make, make, not being able to join us. Uh, so I would accept a motion to review and approve the prior meeting minutes. So moved. Second, Councillor Psalms. Um, I read them, they look good. Andra, and did you say anything? Uh, no changes. Okay. All in favor, say aye. 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 Motion is approved. And Fred, did you want to, is this the time when you would want to say anything about? Um, yeah, sure. I'll, I'll just motion. jump in quick about the budget and uh, where we are. So um, as you know, that we're working on, we're working on the ClearGov platform for um, clear, transparent delivery of budgets to uh, both internally facing and public facing. So I think the tool is going to be amazing. Um, we have a number of uh, people that are not super tech savvy and they are not having problems getting uh, data inputted into the SIP budget through ClearGov. So that's very positive. Um, my target date for uh, budget preparation is the 11th. We're gonna have most of those components put together uh, for that. So ahead of the, uh, the time period that we had hoped, uh, we are still awaiting word from uh, the governor's office uh, in terms of uh, how we are anticipating proceeding with the budget this year. The executive orders uh, do not uh, allow us to continue um, having the uh, budget process uh, virtually as we are and uh, not having referendum votes or however we choose to do it. So uh, Jonathan Harris, the governor's office is working with a subcommittee that works on uh, executive orders to uh, see that we have something to work with on that side. Um, but out outside of that, I think everything is going quite well otherwise. You asked that question a long time ago of the governor's office. Yes, it's been a long time. And I, I did get a response from uh, one of the attorneys from that subcommittee that he has that, that puts those together, but it's been, uh, well, it wasn't even on their radar. When I first asked the question, they said, oh, that's a good right. question. And that was probably every bit of two months ago now. Yeah. But yeah. I did send them uh, our budget timeline. And I said, here's a sample of our budget timeline. And I suspect that other municipalities are gonna be facing the same thing. So <laughs> I, I asked that there be some action and here we are in January and it's not yet here. So the, the recent vote in the legislature to extend the uh, emergency authority of the governor, did that not extend his his emergency orders? No, it, it doesn't. So the, the emergency orders had um, very specific dates and references in them. So as an example, municipal budgeting, it specifically referred to the 2020-2021 budget, but now we're on the 21-22 budget year. So um, they have to, they have to, it shouldn't be a difficult thing because all they're really going to do is take some of those earlier uh, executive orders, like seven, 7-H, I think, was one of them. They're going to take one of those earlier orders, and all they have to do is make some quick changes to dates and times, and yeah. that should get us through this year. Sure. Okay. Well, thank you. Sure. Absolutely. I'm, I'm going to move to full business, and uh, Andre, we are ready to act on, or actually ready to discuss, not ready to act on the first one, but... Uh, if you want to make a motion, we can talk about it and then uh, see how far we get. Sure. So I make a motion to adopt a proposed an ordinance providing for property tax exemption for farm buildings 
and additional exemption for farm machinery in the town of Ledyard as contained in the draft dated November 18th, 2020. Second by Councillor Song. So um, it, it's been quite a while since we've looked at this. Uh, initially, we were trying to get something done for, uh, for buildings only before the November 1 deadline <clears throat> so that people could file. But then a suggestion was made that we consider farm machinery. And once we added that to the mix, uh, up came the subject of Public Act 490. Um, so we we put the whole process on hold because 490 complicates things. Um, and then it went back to land use. And land use has since moved it forward for buildings only because of the complications with Public Act 490 and permission. So I went in and looked at the spreadsheet that the tax assessor put together for us, which had uh, the estimated tax loss for buildings and farm machinery. And I actually had more questions than I felt like I could answer for the council if they were asked. So I, I put together a list of those questions and I thought perhaps tonight we could just go over those questions, see if we had any other ones, and if not, we could forward the list to the tax assessor and ask her to join us at our next meeting. There's no sense of urgency on this. We have until next November 1st. So I think it's, it's imperative that we do this carefully because there, while it looks like the tax impact to the town in terms of tax loss is very small, I wanna make sure that that's absolutely the case because when you look at, at um, the value of the land in Public Act 490 and then take into account machinery, I, I think we, as I say, need to be careful. So um, I, I, I'm gonna refer to columns in the spreadsheet, but I'll try and be a little more clear than that. My first question was, what do uh, columns E and F signify about the, the assessed value? And that's under the columns for Public Act 490. So it shows the 490 value and without 490 value. Um, and I think the answer to that is pretty straightforward. I just want to make sure. But the next one I had a lot more questions about, which is columns G and H, which talk about uh, whether a given property may qualify or in the foreseeable future it could qualify. And I'm trying to understand or I'd like to know what the criteria for that putting a checkbox that they may or may not qualify would be because there are some big farms here and a lot of a lot of tax revenue or at least uh, tax value. The next one um, was about how columns O, P, and Q work. And those were the ones which speak to uh, under machinery it shows the estimated assessed value than the state exemption, but then it said it shows an amount to the max, which I could probably figure out, but I don't want to guess. Um, and then something I, I didn't understand the abbreviation. It was potential LC, maybe it's location assessed, and then potential tax loss. But the columns are blank with the exception of two properties. So I wanted to understand the tax assessments thinking on that as well. So that was my list. And Andre, if you had any other questions about it, um, we can add them now or later. And then if you're in agreement, we could invite the tax assessor to the next meeting. Yeah, I, I think that's a good idea to have her come. Um, I guess I'm a she's little usually tough. really helpful when she I mean she's very thorough and knowledgeable but but um, in this sure. case I, I think I'd like to hear it from hers her I guess my question would be um, for the addresses that are listed and there is uh, was, what was your your first question about ENF um, uh, there are farms listed that have no um, like there's not you know ENF are blank so then yeah. I'm curious 
why are they on here at all? Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. You know, like I forgot about. That. Yeah, Paul and Betty Mogul's properties listed. Um, Holdridge Farm Nursery. I mean, how could that be blank? Um, so anyway, that would be my question. Yeah, yeah. I think one of them in relation to the OP and Q ones, the limit to max that you referred to, Bill, that is yep. how much, <clears throat> excuse me, how much uh, tax, how much taxable property they have now until they hit that $100,000 threshold. So. Yeah, I, I, I kind of thought that um, over on the land side, you can see how that works. Right. Um, she did it a little bit differently, but you can see where she, in column K, she moved some of them out to $100,000 and then chose what the tax loss is. So I'm not, she didn't, I don't think she followed the same method in the machine you said. Okay. So, but yeah. And, and, yeah. That and it'll sense. probably be helpful because people that had wanted to apply for the farm designation had to do so by December 31st. So... Uh, if she attends the January 20th finance meeting, she should have a pretty good update in terms of what, which ones are, are qualified as farms and which ones are not. Yep. So, okay, I will, I will plan to or will you invite her and I will follow up on the January 20th finance meeting. Okay, that sounds good. I also had a, a comment on the ordinance itself. Um, I, I think we have to send it off to an attorney, which we should do anyway. Um, but one of the or one of the paragraphs speaks to it, it, it strikes corporate farms. But I I think that's going to be hard to do in practice because it, it then refers to individual farmers whether through an incorporation, a partnership, et cetera. So you, you can't really eliminate a corporation because right. farms incorporate. I mean, businesses do, people incorporate. So I'm not sure how we, I know that the intent makes sense that we were looking for I, small I think farmers, the that's who we want to help. But what if a, um, go ahead, Roxanne. Yeah, maybe we, struck that out by accident. I think the intent was that you didn't want to like make it available to um, solar farms or, you know, corporate farms in that way. But um, so maybe we just need to just unstrike that because as you as you mentioned, you know, regular agricultural farms can incorporate. So yeah. I think that was the reason that was taken out. So. Okay. And we do want to leave the solar farms out because, you know, if a farm sells all its property to uh, releases to a solar farm, it doesn't look like a farm anymore. And it doesn't really match right. at least part so, of the so I think they were, ordinance. I think they were thinking a group of farmers or partnership or corporation would be something more like, you know, um, an enterprise for things like that. But so that's, that's a good question. And we could probably just put that back in. Doesn't the use of the word agriculture imply that solar farms would not be included? Well, and we, uh, we actually put that in um, section 3.2. It says such exemptions shall not apply to any solar array farms or okay. such individual owner group partnerships or corporations. Yeah, just to make so, sure that it does, because you can yeah. claim that a, a farm structure because it's on a farm. I don't know if it would fly, but I think this is us just being yep. next to okay, careful to make sure that the intent is we're not we're not intending to subsidize solar arrays. Right. So okay. They have their own subsidies too. Yeah. So solar yes. solar yeah. farms, if you will, have their own set of subsidies. So they would probably go for those as opposed to this anyway. But yeah, I don't think there's any harm in making sure we uh, keep it to truly agriculture. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Okay. So I'll make a motion to table this for now until we can come back. Is there a second? Second. Okay. 
All in favor of tabling the motion, say aye. Aye. Councilor Song says aye. All right, thank you very much. And We're ready for the next one, I'm just because I find my place here. If you want to make the second second item motion. Sure. I motion to adopt proposed amendments to ordinance number 100-010 and ordinance establishing a housing authority for the town of Ledyard as contained in the draft dated October 21st, 2020. In addition, adopt a proposed Appendix A, agreement between the Town of Ledyard and Ledyard Housing Authority regarding payment in lieu of taxes as contained in the draft dated November 4th, 2020. And Councillor Song seconds. So I believe we are ready to move on this one. Um, I read through the, the ordinance as we finally wrote it. And if you'll recall back to our early discussions on this, we were waiting to hear from uh, Connecticut Housing Finance Authority. And the mayor did, re did hear back from them and they basically said, whatever you wanna do. <laughs> so where we last left it, we rewrote the ordinance to reduce the uh, pilot from 7% to 10% of gross rents and then we attached an agreement to the ordinance, which would be agreement between the town and the housing authority, because we can't do this unilaterally, that they would put 3%, or they would put 3% of their gross rents into a stiff fund set aside for future maintenance and capital improvement. So we can pass the ordinance this way with the agreement as an attachment, um, but it doesn't actually become effective until the housing authority agrees with us that they want to do this. And once they sign it, then, it, then it's fully, fully executed. And I personally, I, I think it's what we wanted to do all along. And I think it's a great move. Bill? Yeah, Mary. Okay. Uh, on Appendix A, going down a couple of uh, paragraphs, uh, will you talk about the stiff? You don't yes. say how much that they should be putting in. And I think there should be a number in there. It is desirable for the- no, it's, Mary, it's mentioned, it in the, uh, it's, in, it's mentioned in the second to the last, last paragraph where it says, now therefore be it resolved that the municipality amends and will accept payment in lieu of taxes from the housing authority from the town of Ledger at a rate of 7% of the net shelter per annum. In addition, the housing authority agrees to allocate 3% of the net shelter rent annum to the Ledger Housing Authority short-term investment fund stiff for capital improvements to maintain the King's Corner Manor facility. It's in the second to the last okay, paragraph. No, no. Okay, what happened is, okay, I have the October 21st edition, okay. Oh. All right, yeah. so I'll get it as I just was concerned when I read this that there was no amount put in for the stiff, but you're telling me it's right. in the next paragraph. Okay, I had the wrong, the uh, earlier edition. Okay. Yeah. There's, okay. A, there's a new version of the agreement appendix dated November 4th, which okay, does, I have, does I say have October 21st. Okay, no problem. It's yep. long okay. after because I was concerned at, as the turnover and the reason that the housing authority is in the predicament it is now was past mismanagement. So yeah, this is right. fine. This is fine. Okay, good. Andrew, any comments? Uh, I have a couple of comments. One is, um, I, and this question, the answer to this doesn't really affect my, my decision on it. I'm curious to know though, because they've improved their rent stratification and they've brought the rents uh, up to a more current level, even though we're reducing from 10% to seven, 
is the net still going to be higher because they've brought the rents up? Um, I don't know if anybody's run those numbers. Um, my second, I think we talked about this too. My second question is simply about our authority here um, uh, to insist that that some of the money is put into stiff. Like, I, I guess my question is, we can put it in the ordinance, but what is the accountability structure? Like, if they just just decide not to, we do we we don't have really any way to. Um, hold them accountable. Is that right? Uh, yeah, no, we, so there's an appendix, which Mary was just talking about, which is an agreement that we sign with the housing authority. And if they don't want to agree to it and they don't sign it, then this whole ordinance becomes null. Because you're right, we can't just say they have to put 3% of the rent in a stiff fund unless we have a written agreement, and that's what the appendix is. It's a written okay, agreement. so if they were to not follow through, that effectively nullifies the agreement. Yeah, but you also, all you need to do is call the Connecticut Housing Finance Authority, and they would get on their case. Uh, so there is some oversight, not by us, but by them. Okay. And you also get a copy of the annual audit that they have done, right. and audit will show what's been put aside for capital. Right. Uh, back over okay. to your original question, Andra, I, I agree with you completely. I think that with the rent stratification and you know some of the rents that were 60 and $70 a month that are now increasing pretty dramatically, I think that the reduction from 10 to seven will probably yield roughly the same dollars uh, to the town for the pilot payment anyway. Okay. That's positive. The numbers so. run but, in terms but, of Sorry, but to your knowledge, have the numbers been run? No. Okay. No, no. and, and um, I have not seen, and, and that might be something that should be asked of Colleen Lauer is, show us your monthly uh, rents and your rent rolls to see what you're doing on a monthly basis and then annualize that, because that would yeah. be interesting to know. Uh, I, would, I would love to know what the ballpark numbers are, at least. Yep, yep absolutely. When the, when, the, when the Housing Authority appealed to the Finance Committee back in September, at that time, 10% of their net annual, annual shelter money was around $11,000. So, so $111,000 um, a year in gross rents? That's what it was at that time before they um, implemented the stratification. And from my, my understanding, it's only one or two units that is paying more at this time. Some of them were grandfathered in. Is that correct? Yeah, it's, yes, that is correct. Yeah. Yeah, yeah there, there are several that That's are at $400 to $600 now. Yeah. 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 Um, just two I quick things. They had only one. Go ahead, Fred. Oh, um, I was just going to say. Um, do recall that that one of the things that uh, you know we were seeking an additional grant on this, and this was this reduction from the pilot payment was one of the things that DOH and Chaffa both were uh, excited about. That if the town would do this, they 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 were happy to see it and they wanted to see a copy. But also important was they they did give us the additional grant. So now we have two million eight fifty five two oh five that's going to King's Corner. So mm -hmm. I, I think it is important to go ahead and show that we're, you know, we're, we're acting in good faith. They gave us a, an incredible grant that's going to totally transform that place. Yeah. And in exchange, I think we're gonna do, or well, I would ask that you make the change to pilot. Totally agree. And then hopefully next fall, we'll be ready to vote. this incredible place. Yeah, yeah. yes, yeah. I'm ready to vote. Okay, all in favor say aye. Councillor Ingalls votes aye. As does Councillor Songs, and the motion passes. Thank you very much. That's a good one. Absolutely. Uh, okay, is there any other old business? Would anyone like to modify the agenda under new business? We have a new addition which should show up is item three. There's a bid waiver for Bloom Shapiro. If you don't see it on your screen, you all you have to do is refresh the screen and it should, should appear. 
So hearing no additional items, Andra, would you like to make the first motion? Sure, I just refreshed. Give me just a second. Oh, okay, I'll, I'll do it. Uh, I move to recommend the town council transfer $105,000 from account 21040107-54015 Lantern Hill Bridge to new account 21040107-54007 Dash G is in George 0010, CLH Walk Bike Lane for engineering consultant services for design application permitting and bidding services for the lots of Ledger High School multi use pathway and sidewalk extension project. This supersedes the motion of the same amount that was approved at the November 17, 2020 Town Council meeting. Second. Thank you. Um, so the reason we're voting on this again is uh, we neglected to identify where the money was coming from in terms of account numbers and where it was going to in terms of account numbers. So this just adds the detail. The dollar amounts are the same. The project is the same. We just have to do it again to uh, make sure you have all the details. Sure. Okay, any questions? Yeah. All in favor, ready to vote? Ready to vote. Say aye. Councillor Ingalls votes aye. As does Councillor Songs. Give me a second to catch up, please. That's my place. Hey, we're good. Second aye. Andrew? Okay. You ready? Yep. I make a motion to approve a revised Appendix A qualifying income schedule in accordance with ordinance number 200-004 revision one and ordinance to provide property tax relief for certain homeowners age 65 or over or permanently and totally disabled revision one as contained in the draft dated December 14th, 2020. That's the Psalm second. So um, after many years of study, we, we changed the, the ordinance last year for tax relief for uh, homeowners over 65 and permanently and totally disabled. The state publishes an income level schedule every year. The amounts went up by six or $700 this year. And we're attaching that appendix with the new qualifying amounts from the state uh, so that we don't have to change the ordinance. We're just revising the appendix. This is something we'll presumably be doing every year. So questions, comments, ready to vote? Yeah, ready to vote. All in, all in favor, say aye. Councilor Ingalls votes aye. Councilor Songs votes aye and the motion passes. Thank you very much. Next item, please. I make a motion to grant a bid waiver to Bloom Shapiro in the total amount of $62,500 to conduct auditing services for the general government, WPCA, and schools for the fiscal year ending June 30th, 2021. In addition, appoint Bloom Shapiro to conduct auditing services for the general government, WPCA, and schools for the fiscal year ending June 30th, 2021, in accordance with Chapter 3, Section 11 of the Town Charter, RFP number 2018-070, auditing services. Councilor Sohn, second. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm gonna ask Roxanne to help me with this one. I, um, I talked with Marsha about it back in November, early December. And she asked if, if I thought we should have a, um, a bid waiver. We're in the, this is the last year of the audit. Um, under the current contract, but the dollar went up slightly. Was it a percent? One percent. One percent. One percent. One percent. So since the dollar amount changed, um, and, and this is an option year, so they, they could increase the amount in the option year, but um, we could have gone out to bid with this, but we are extremely pleased with the work they've done in the last few years. 
Um, this is very much like a sole source, although we will go out to bid again when the time comes, but we didn't feel we needed to go to bid uh, because this is an option year, even though the, the price has changed slightly. Um, this firm has been on time, even ahead of schedule. Uh, and compared to the last auditing firm we used, we were finding ourselves, uh, was it three, four, five months late? Right? I, it, it, it just dragged on forever <clears throat> for the last firm. Um, these people have also given us much more and better advice and counsel. Um, they've made management recommendations that actually mean something. And, and I, I think we're all pleased with their work to date. So that's the, the bid waiver and the request to approve. Yeah, I, I'll just say one thing, Bill. It, it's, it's amazing to see when they when Bloom Shapiro comes in here, they will make recommendations to staff as they're as they're sitting here working with us. They'll, they'll make suggestions on how we should handle things better. Um, we never got that before. I mean, these no. people are here providing us guidance and advice that, that we never saw before. And as you recall, when we were all on the finance committee, then when we, the previous auditor would deliver the report, it was like they were speaking Swahili or something and we had no idea what <laughs> was going on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh. And, and they would not give us advice, but, you know, we no, said, how can we do better? What, what do we need to do differently? Well, we're just, we're, we don't take responsibility for that. And, you know, they refer right. us to all the disclaimers and waivers. And yeah, they we right. absolutely wouldn't even and give it, it wouldn't provide it. Yeah. So, yeah. And I, I think in the last few years, our processes have improved. We've tightened up our, yeah. our financial controls. We're in much better shape. So, yeah, I agree. Ready to vote, Andra? Ready. All right. All in favor, say aye. Councillor Ingalls votes aye. Councillor Soms votes aye. The motion passes. Thank you very much. Next item, please. I make a motion to recommend the Town Council approve the Town Council Department Fiscal Year 2021-2022 budget in the amount of $176,342. Councillor Soms seconds. So we've actually had a slight decrease as a result of uh, uh, lack of travel and uh, lack of um, participation by the treasurer in, uh, in uh, conference meetings because of COVID. So mm -hmm. I think it was a 0.19% decrease, very small, but still a decrease. Uh, and that's, um, I think, a good thing to be doing in, this, in these times. So everything else has remained the same. Mm -hmm. So uh, I want to take this moment and make it again next week to point out that this 176,342 budget dollar budget does not go to pay town counselors. <laughs> <laughs> so all in favor, please say aye. <laughs> Councillor Ingalls votes aye. So does Councillor Song. And the motion passes, thank you. And the last and final item, please. Um, I've lost my place, where are we? Five? Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, yep, okay, budget. sorry. Uh, yep, okay. Uh, I make a motion to recommend the town council approve the town council department fiscal year 2021-2022 capital improvement budget in the total amount of $3,580. Councilor Psalm seconds. So um, the two things that are in here are the annual $1,500 that we set aside for when we need to purchase a laptop for a new counselor if we need to, and we haven't, but we set them aside in, in, in advance. And the second thing is about $2,000 for new chairs for the council itself. Um, the casters have broken off at least one, maybe two chairs. Some of the backs are broken. They date back to 19, I forget, 18, 1980 something, when the police station was became the uh, town council chambers. Those chairs are original from that time. Um, there were some comments in the note up in the in the notes about uh, it's a challenge to find chairs that actually fit behind that 
that dais. Uh, so apparently these do, they recline, they go up and down, the arms go up and down so we can fit them up to the, to the, to the uh, counter, if you will. Uh, so long overdue. And uh, if, we, if we have to find something to cut, we might be able to make it through another year since we haven't used the chairs this year. But for now, I, I'm suggesting we put it in. Agree. Yep, I agree. Okay. All in favor, please say I aye. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> Councilor Ingalls votes aye. <laughs> Sounds like there are three out of two votes for aye. <laughs> Councilor Solomon votes aye as well. And that motion passes. And I think that's everything. So thank you all very much. You're welcome. We'll see I'm you in see an you hour, Bill. Uh, yeah, seeing your community relations and you too, Roxanne. Uh, okay, I'll probably, probably Mary. Yes. <laughs> I'll be on for the January 20th one, which I think is the discussion with the uh, MPTN. Yes. Yep. Yep. Look forward to that one. Yep. Okay. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Right. Have a good night. Good night. Good night. Bye. Bye.